So 10 minutes. This is I switch myself in, right? Yeah. Okay. 10 minutes, and I'll show you five and one. All right? Go ahead. Okay, so good morning, everybody. My name is Ben Davis Russell, in case you don't already know. I go to McMaster University. I'm in third year honors physics, and I'm working here at Triumph under the supervision of Rich Helmer on the Snow Plus experiment. So before I get into it a little bit, um, we're, Snow Plus is actually located at Snow Lab, which is an underground physics lab, the deepest active physics lab in the world. And so because of that, we get to go underground with miners and work with all the miners and go down and pretend we're miners and take cool pictures like this. Basically, it's a lot of fun going to Snow Lab and working there. So if you get the chance, definitely, definitely go for it. So now into my talk a little bit. So I'm going to start off talking about the Snow Plus experiment, going over the general idea of it, then a little bit about the physics, so neutrinos and double beta decay, then into the Snow Plus detector itself, then my own work, the neck optics problem I'm facing, and then some first analysis results, and then conclusions and next steps. So starting off with the Snow Plus experiment, the Snow Plus experiment is a large liquid scintillator detector-based neutrino experiment at Snow Lab, like I said, near Sudbury, which is 2.1 kilometers underground. So basically in experimental particle physics, there are two different types of experiments you can, you can do. You can do accelerator experiments like we have here at Triumph, where you're using very high energies, smashing particles together, and then looking for exotic particles that might decay off or might be created due to these very high energies. Then you have detector experiments such as Snow Plus, where you have a nice big detector and you fill it with some material and get your conditions just right such that you can observe things that are either passing through or created in that vessel. So those are the two general particle physics experiments you can do. So Snow Plus is a detector based one. And it's a follow up to the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment, which solved the solar neutrino problem. And we fill our acrylic vessel with liquid scintillator, as opposed to heavy water from the snow experiment. So liquid scintillator that we use is linear alkyl benzene, which is a organic liquid that gives off light when charged particles pass through it. So now a little bit about neutrinos first. So neutrinos, there are six standard leptons, of which neutrinos are leptons, as well as their antiparticles. So you have your electron, your muon, and your tau. Those are charged, and they increase with mass as you move down. And each has an associated neutrino. So neutrinos only interact with gravity and the weak nuclear force. So because of that, they can pass through just about anything. They're very hard to detect. They're, so they're very small as well, but they do have mass with squared mass differences, and they actually have the ability to oscillate between flavors, as you can sort of see from this diagram here. So basically, a neutrino, say an electron neutrino that starts off in the sun, by the time we detect it on Earth, it could very well be a muon neutrino, for example. Now, double beta decay physics, a little bit about this. This is important because the first stage of the Snow Plus experiment is searching for neutrino list double beta decay. So what is this? Well, first of all, most of us know beta decay, where you have a neutron that converts to a proton emitting a beta particle and an antineutrino, where in this case, the beta is an electron. So double beta decay, as you can sort of see from this diagram here, there are 35 isotopes in nature where beta decay is energetically forbidden, but they can double beta decay, which is just two simultaneous beta decays. So you see two betas emitted and two antineutrinos. And then there's neutrino list double beta decay, which has only been theoretically proposed so far, whereas beta de double beta decay sorry, has been observed. So that's where you would observe something like this, just two betas emitted and no neutrinos. And for this to occur, that would mean that the two emitted neutrinos would be canceling each other out, which means that the neutrino is the same thing as the antineutrino. Which, and this would be the first particle of this kind ever found and would open up a whole new area of physics beyond the standard model, so it would be very interesting. Now a little bit about the Snow Plus detector. So we're going to start off in the middle. Here's the acrylic vessel. So this is not gold. It's actually clear acrylic. So it's 12 meters in diameter. And then if you look up a little bit, there's the acrylic vessel neck. So that's 7 meters in height. I'll get to that soon. And so the linear alkyl benzene, the liquid scintillator that I was talking about, it gets filled in this acrylic vessel here, 780 tons of it. And then, so that's basically where all the events occur. Everything that we're looking at is going to be occurring inside this vessel with the LAB. And then the eyes of the experiment is this big sphere here, the photomultiplier tube sphere. So there are 9,500 PMTs, and these basically just see everything that goes on inside the vessel, and they're able to record these events by detecting the light. And then in between the two spheres and outside between the rock, this is dug out of rock, there's water shielding to reduce backgrounds, and there's also a special liner on the rock to reduce backgrounds again. 
Okay, so now I'm going to talk about my work a little bit. So I worked on, my analysis project was the neck optics tuning. So here's a picture of the actual neck of the acrylic vessel. This is from outside the photomultiplier tube sphere. So first I want to introduce to you the problem that I'm facing. So if you look at this picture here, it's sort of blocked off by this whiteboard. But this one here, this is a picture from inside of the acrylic vessel, okay? So if you look at this pink pad here, hopefully you can see that, that's inside the acrylic vessel. Whereas each one of these is a photomultiplier tube. That's actually two and a half meters away from the pink pad. So that gives you an idea sort of of how clear the actual acrylic is. Whereas when you look at this picture here, this is the neck of the acrylic vessel. It's a picture from inside the neck. So you can see the walls are much, much darker and definitely not as clear as the acrylic vessel. But is it opaque? That's what we don't know. So right now, the analysis package that we use is, is set to that material being completely opaque. So what is the problem? Let's, let's say that the material is not opaque, because if it is, then we don't have any problems. So if you follow the point here, say there's an event that starts here or anywhere really, it doesn't really matter, but then it shoots up and hits an area in the neck somewhere on one of these two points so that it can still hit the neck and then pass through. But since this is not clear, some of the light energy will be absorbed in this neck. And then once the light passes through and detected by a photomultiplier tube here, here, it will have less energy than it originally started with. So because of that, you're gonna characterize that event or particle incorrectly because it will have lower energy than it actually had when it was first created. So that's what I want to fix. I want to be able to analyze these particles properly and answer the question, what is the percent attenuation of light that goes through the neck? So to start, I looked at for, to start the analysis, I looked at calibration runs from the SNOW experiment. So if you look at the bottom right here, this is a laser ball. It's very cool. It's the optical calibration workhorse. So it shoots out light of one wavelength in every direction, hitting every photomultiplier tube. And you can place this basically anywhere you want in the acrylic vessel. So this one was put about here at, say, 500 centimeters on the z-axis. So here's the, an output plot that it creates. So on the x-axis, you can see the PMT number. So this is, uh, there's about 9,500 of them. Like I said, so it hits every photomultiplier tube. And then the y-axis is you can think of as light output. It's called occupancy, but basically every time a PMT gets hit by a flash of light from the laser ball, it gets recorded on the y-axis. So I can actually simulate this plot myself with the exact same statistics and make sure everything matches. And, but the only difference is that in our simulation, I'm running the neck material as dark, as what it's currently set to as black. So if there's any difference, then a ratio should be able to tell because the, da the data cannot lie. So when I divide the data by the simulation, I get a plot that looks like this. So now you can see it's the exact same x-axis, the y-axis is now that ratio, and we can see that it all basically flatlines out at the bottom, which is good. Everything should flatline out, though, if the neck material is correct. So these nice jutting lines here tell me that the neck material that we're using is incorrect. And since the ratio is about 50 times greater for data to the simulation, it shows that the neck material is actually clearer than it's set to in our simulation. So now I, now I need to try and actually characterize this material. And so now there's actually some other uh, good simulations that I can do, or sorry, uh, yeah, so this was, this you can see, this one was taken from high up on the Z, and the PMTs that are hit are the ones up here. Those are the ones with these big errors. So now, now to actually look at it in terms of the z-axis position. So this is the same plot, the same ratio on the y-axis, the data divided by the simulation. Whereas now on the x-axis, there's a PMT z-axis position. So now the, the highest up z-axis is the one that really matters. So you can see again, it's about two times more, the data to the simulation. And this is again with the dark material. And when I run the simulation, making the neck material 10% clearer, then I get a number that's much more closer to one. So that gives you a, an idea of the kind of analysis that I need to do. Now I still have much more simulations and um, more precise analysis techniques to perform. But basically once I'm, once I'm done, I will be able to input this material into the simulation package for Snow Plus. And this will actually allow us to reduce our systematic error because now we'll be able to increase the fiducial volume around the high up on the z-axis of close to the neck because now these, exper or these events will be characterized properly because the neck material is right. So we will understand the, what the, the PMTs attacked when they're nice and high up. And so that's, that's basically my, my work and a little bit about the Snow Plus experiment. And so I'd be happy to answer any questions as you glance over my conclusions. Thank you.
so maybe a little bit off track question. So what's the difference between the liquid uh, scintillator and heavy water? Um, the difference in terms of like optical properties, or because I mean, obviously, he well, heavy water is much heavier than yeah, yeah, the liquid scintillator. In terms of performance, right? Um, well, heavy water is it. it would, it's a different experiment. So snow, they were looking for neutrinos from the sun, um, electron neutrinos, um, and so the the main detection method for that is to look for Cherenkov um, light, Cherenkov radiation, just like James was talking about in the T2K experiment. And heavy water is actually best best for that, um, for the optical properties. Um, and whereas liquid scintillator, we're, we're looking at actually, uh, di we're not looking for Cherenkov light at all. Actually, Cherenkov light becomes a background. So you want to change the um, the fluid to make something that is more. Um, better for, for actually creating vents inside the vessel as opposed to um, the neutrinos from the sun were just passing through, whereas the double beta decay phase, it's the material is um, originating inside the vessel, so the scintillator is much better for that, for not creating Cherenkov light. That's the main reason, yeah. Did you? Yeah, maybe just a quick question. So you said that the Essentially, you are tuning your simulation to data. Right? Right. So you are trying to understand how much more clear your material is, uh, right? because data seems to be telling you this. So you could essentially have uh, calibrated it beforehand, so you are not losing events uh, in the data. Is that right? So the, essentially, the events are properly reconstructed in the data because the material is much more clear than what you thought. Is that right? Right, yes, yes, yes. Since this was a calibration run, there's no cuts made or anything like that. So this is just, and so you know it has to be, has to be accurate because it's just a laser ball. You're just getting the light output of the PMTs and that's it. When we actually take data, right, because the run I, I have, or the, all the runs I have are from those laser ball calibration runs. So they're, they're purely for calibration, but when we're actually taking events for the experiments, we cut all the events around the neck so the fiducial volume is, is, is decreased. I think with the, the double beta decay phase, right now it's about a 3.5 meter fiducial volume sphere. Um, and it's actually, uh, for the snow experiment, it was a five and a half meter fiducial volume, but it was reduced even more around the neck just because of those neck events. They knew that they couldn't understand them properly. So uh, if, if I get this new material in properly, we'll be able to increase that fiducial volume right around the, the, the neck high up on the z-axis. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So, how much percentage? Um, I'm I'm not sure yet. Yeah, I'm not 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 at that level yet. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So if you go back to your to the calibration. This one? Yeah, just I mean, yeah, either of those. Yeah. I, mean, I understand this is basically PMT channel kind of the location somewhere. Yeah. Do you understand the structure of these spikes? Uh, why is it not more homogeneous? Yeah, it's because, um, so this run was taken at the 500, uh, 500 centimeters in the z-axis. Yeah, so, so the spikes are gonna be the PMTs that are higher up here, right, and the ones lower here. The PMT channel is not numbered in any way that, that makes sense. No, it's, it's by the, like, it's logical channel number. It's by the, uh, the disk read out the channel, the actual electrical numbers. So they're actually on, a, on the, if you think of this 2D slice as a whole sphere, it sort of starts like one around here down to say like 150, something like that, and sort of goes like that. It, they're, they're numbered really weirdly. So yeah, that, it's not a good um, a geometrical representation, but yeah, that's, what, that's why they're all weird spikes. Then if you take your ratio plot, I guess that critically depends on how well you think the you know the position of these PMPs, right? Right. Oh, I, I do know that we do know the position of the PMPs yeah. very well. That's that's why I was then making this the uh, z-axis one. This that was just an initial check to show that something's off, right? right? Yeah. That is, that doesn't. I mean, then I can I can make we, there there is a database that has all the PMTs based on that number, then x, y, and z position. Do you roughly know what that would be? The level of precision knowledge of these. Of each PMT? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're known to with, within um, 0 0.1 of a millimeter, every single one. Yeah, 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 so I have all that information. Then the, uh, actually, these error bars, 
here on the, on the data. That's just a limitation from the actual data taken during the calibration runs. They didn't know the, the position as well then. So that's why you get these. These are about 18 centimeters error bars. That's, that's all that the, uh, the width of the laser ball could actually detect at that point. So that's why only the, only the, last, the last bar matters to me at the moment. And then I guess when you change, it was, was a nice effect of how you, how you change how, how the blackness uh, changes the actual read out there. And it's quite a dramatic effect, right? You can put it back yeah. to one. But I guess there's a lot of structure in all the other ones that cannot originate from this uh, neck right. read out. So, I mean, there, there must have other sources. Uh, is that true? Or? Basically, all, it's all consistent. All these, they're not, they're not exactly at one, but that's just due to, to some other error and, and the variations between um, different things in the, in the slight, slightly different in the simulation, like new data that were inputted before that we now gained information from Snow Plus. The simulation can actually be slightly better, slightly different, but basically the, these are all consistent with all this, the data plots and the simulation plots. Um, the ratio, at least, it's all like all these values before are consistent, and these are the only ones that actually change between so between comparison. This problem for now, right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 those. Yeah, yeah, those, yeah, exactly. The only thing that actually affects the neck is the ones that are high up on the z-axis. So everything else is consistent for all the runs. Okay, yeah. So where exactly is this? Um, these thirty-five. Uh, Ice, double beta decaying isotopes, where are they going? Are they dissolved in the, in the scintillator or are they just placed in the center? Yeah, no, they're, um, the scintillator is loaded um, with, the, with the isotopes. We're using actually uh, tellurium, tellurium 130. So it's, it's doped into the scintillator. You start off with a low loading percentage, 0.1%, um, and then you, you see how that runs, and then you can increase it up to actually 3% loading with, with tellurium. So that's all done. There's, there's a chemistry lab that does all the testing for that. So they've already proved that they can load up to something like 0.3%, and it gets, yeah, it gets homogeneously mixed in directly into the scintillator. Yeah. Got it. So how do you get it out again to try to test a different isotope? That's Presumably, the chemistry people. To um, well, yeah, that's that's a that's a much later phase. Yeah, that's 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 testing that'll ongoing now. If, it's, if it is even possible to take to take an isotope out, um, yeah, it, it wouldn't be a problem if it has to stay in. But right now, that's that's not the worry. It's just making sure it can get in and and, and stay in and, stay and give you the light output that you need. Yeah, right. Awesome. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Let's thank Ben one more time.